Called the most diverse and best educated generation, Gen Z knows that they want to work for a socially conscious employer. They look for diversity in an organization. An article on Forbes about Gen Z by Nick Diaz, a 25-year-old software developer, reads, We are the largest generation, making up 32% of the global population, and a talent pool whose potential is only starting to be recognized. In fact, Gen Z is educated, skilled, socially conscious, and resilient. We are digital natives who grew up with evolving technologies, which is true. In the right workplace, we're willing to work incredibly hard and adapt to new environments. After all, that's what we've been doing for years. After one of the most intense periods in modern history, it continues, Gen Z is tackling our next big challenge, getting a job. The oldest members of his generation are now 25, just a few years out of college. Joining me now are my guests for today. I have Uke Enu Jr., co-founder, CEO, Go Nomad Africa from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Uke, for joining me. Blessings for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, we also have Adibanke Adiribibe, human resources professional from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Adibanke. Blessings for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My pleasure. And finally, we have Esther Ariemon Kale, if I'm correct, educationist, Sheffield, United Kingdom. Thank you, Esther, for joining me. Thank you for having me. And yes, you're correct. That's oh, my name. Yes, perfect. <laughs> all right. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be a very interesting episode. And please feel free to be as open as possible. Well, by my calculation, I have two Gen Zs and, of course, one HR personnel. So, you know, the field is basically covered. So let's dive right into it. And I'm going to start with Uke. Uke, is that it? Is that, is that the name? Can you hear me? Yes, you're correct. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to start by asking you this question. Why exactly do you think that Gen Zs act the way they do? Okay. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so when you say act the way they do, that's very relative, right? Um, from, from my perspective, I believe that Gen Zs are one of the most resourceful generations of all time. And you find that Gen Zs are a group of people who want to start businesses. They're very entrepreneurial in nature, right? And they love to put the vision and the mission of what they do first. So um, from whichever side of the divide that you stand, I think that the, the reason why Gen Z is a very special generation, and you know, no credit to you, you've mentioned some of the reasons why, is simply because we have a bunch of opportunity all around us, right? And that is the reason why we are driven to do the way that the things that we do and act in the way that we act. And, and frankly speaking, I think that it is a very positive generation that is here to do a lot of amazing things that we haven't seen before. I mean, we have seen a lot of technology being involved and we came to meet these things, but trust me, the things that Gen Z is going to do will blow everybody's minds away. All right, thank you so much for that. Esther, do you agree with that? I agree, because we have a lot of information right there on the internet. And one thing Gen Zs don't like is being censored in a way, right? We know what we know, and we want to share what we know. And if you're not allowed to share what we know in the right environment, then we are called, oh, Gen Zs, this Gen Zs, that. But that's not it. We have the information, and we want to share it. The human resource professional now uh, at Debanke, they have both spoken. Do you agree with what they said? I agree with what Uke said earlier about the fact that Gen Z's are actually quite resourceful and entrepreneurial in mind. And also based off what Esther said also, if they are like that. The question asked right now is why do they act in this particular way? I think it's just based off our society. So we also have this defensive, there's also like a defensive and attacking um, feedback from both parties. That's actually what I see to it. All right, but then again, let me come back to you, Ked. Do you see how their behavior can be challenging, especially for those who are recruiting them? I mean, I'm talking about things like, you know, always talking about mental health, always talking about toxicity as though it hasn't been there before or as though you can't stand anything that doesn't work for you. Do you see how that can be a challenge? Okay, so I think from, from my perspective, it's a very good thing in the sense that it is causing change. It is causing conversations to be had around topics that need to be had, right? Uh, previously, you find that these were topics that were concealed. 
even though, like you said, they have existed before, but they were not at the forefront. These were not the conversations that we were having, right? So this generation bringing these things to the forefront makes a whole lot of sense and puts the spotlight on it. So, and you, you find that it's a wave that has gone past the Generation Z. It's also, you now find millennials and other generations also being concerned and taking more care about their mental space because truthfully, if you're not mentally okay, your productivity and you won't be able to, you know, perform at the peak level that you should be performing. So while um, it will get some pushback, but that's the thing we change. It's initially going to be resisted, right? but as time goes on, of course, it's going to be more appreciated because it's actually a good thing. Mental health is a good thing. But this is in no way to support the fact that it can be over leveraged to say, oh, I can't do this task because every single time I'm worried about my mental health. No, you still need to have discipline. You need to have foundational and strong principles. Your values must be solid. But of course, it, it doesn't hurt to take care of your mental health, but your principles must be solid in the workplace. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, I would also like to ask at Debanke, you are an HR professional and you definitely have experience both the millennials and the Gen Z. So, uh, can you share with me some of your experiences and what the challenges have been with these people? Okay, thank you, Blessing. Let me just start off from the two um, the two issues you highlighted about the issue of the mental health and also the toxic, um, toxicity. So, Uke okay, mentioned something earlier on, which I quite agree. But then again, yeah, we all need to understand the fact that the issue of mental health, while it is something quite important and it's something that we almost address in the society as a whole, but to a large extent, we now have a lot of Gen Zs right now. Any little thing in the work, work, um, workplace right now, the next thing they say is that, oh, my boss is a toxic boss, my environment is toxic. But meanwhile, the fact is this, sometimes I've come to also realize as an HR professional, right, that the Gen Zs themselves, they are quite not thorough when it comes to their job, when it comes to the task. So most times they are basically just trying to find an excuse. And the next thing they say is, oh, it's affecting my mental health. It's this, it's this, it's this. Sometimes it might be shocking for you to know that sometimes employees, let me not use the right for right now, Gen Z's might actually be the one making the environment, uh, the work environment quite toxic for us as HR. This is not me trying to raise a voice right now for HR professionals, right? But a whole lot of times when we say this particular issue, is um, this particular thing right now is causing mental health issues for me and my workplace. Trust me, somewhere along the line, the Gen Z uh, employee right now is not doing what he or she needs to do. So the next thing they say right now is, oh, that my organization, my this and this is happening over there. But even beyond the aspect of... Um, mental health and toxicity right now. It's quite challenging right now. But one thing I must say is this, as HR professionals, we have also learned how to manage this process. We've also learned how to make these things work in terms of recruitment. I'm sure you agree with me, Blessing, that recruitment right now, it's changed. Right now, you just need a QR code to apply for job. We don't necessarily need to go to an organization to have your interview. We are having a Zoom interview right now. A lot of interviews are happening right now that is just a one-time Zoom meeting or meet um, interview and you are done. If I want you as my employee, you are in. We no longer have to do these three stages, five stages of interview. So even for us right now as, as HR, we've also learned how to manage these challenges that we're getting right now from Genesis. I don't know if that answers the question, person. Thank you. Reports reaching us at New Central now says protests have broken out on the streets of Ibadan, the capital of Oyo State, southwest Nigeria. Details are still sketchy, but we hear that apart from disrupting the normal activities, public facilities are also being destroyed. Nigeria has increased tension in the last one week following lingering petrol scarcity and difficulties inflicted by the introduction of the new currency note. New Central gathers that the protests have stormed a commercial bank and held the staff and customers hostage. Parents have been called to pick up their children from school. No official statement has been made by authorities yet, but the protest has crippled activities in the city. We'll bring you more details as they unfold. Oh, 
Man trap, no vem for you. It's still live with us on Fafanua Africa, and thank you so much, uh, Adebanke, for that. Well, we want to take uh, some of the Vox Pops from the youths, Gen Zs and Millennials across Africa, to see what they think about this particular issue. So we'll be right back with my guests to discuss this in-house. But right now, do take a listen. How can we engage Gen Z employees in the organization? How can we help them to be more productive? Um, there are a lot of ways we can do that, but three ways I'll just talk about quickly is the first thing um, or the first way is to align purpose with a company mission. Uh, most Gen Zs want to be part of, you know, an organization with a, with a strong sense of purpose. They want to be able to find a common ground between what they want to do or what they want to achieve in life and what the company also wants to achieve. So there's a way we can find a common ground between what this person wants to achieve in life and how we can help plug that, um, plug them or plug that purpose into our own mission. So we must learn to do that. The second thing is we must must learn to nurture the entrepreneur in them um, we can't shut them down they have ideas you know they have a, a very innovative mind so we must learn how to leverage on their constantly buzzing uh, mind they're very energetic they're very agile so how can we nurture that entrepreneurial spirit we should ensure we carry them along on our attacks and activities this bring out the best in them this make 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 um, them understand or make them know that they are important and they are being carried along in the workplace. Another way we can do that is to encourage work from home. We all know what happened after COVID, who were exposed to the fact that they can actually do so much at home, not not necessarily being in a workspace or work environment. As long as they have the internet connection and they have their PCs and they have their iPads and every other working tool they need. This will also encourage them. Another way to effectively engage them also is to make sure they are ahead, they share their ideas, they share their knowledge, they follow through by making sure that that idea is being nurtured and being, being brought to life. We know that Gen Z's are more intelligent, creative and very innovative and these innovations or this innovative um, character and attitude can be put into one leadership and politics. Um, they can be given responsibilities that would make them you know, create the basic creative ideas that will help the country or basically help whatever area they are in. And then for politics, we know that um, many, many Gen Z's try to shy away from politics. If they can be given access into, you know, political sectors or political offices, they can also make the country or wherever state or wherever local government they are a better place. And with their creativity and, you know, highly intelligent mind, it can help create um, better policies for the country. And one of the ways to effectively manage Gen Z in the workplace is to have a competitive compensation and benefit plan. I don't mean compensation alone. Make your pay competitive, but make your benefit intact. Gen Z wants to compare themselves with their colleagues that are being trained in other companies, want to compare themselves with their colleague that knows some skills in their field, in the same field, you know, and they, they don't. So you should make your compensation and benefit, importantly, make it very competitive. Another thing is Gen Z, they really want adventure. So engage them, team bonding, create a Monday, Monday feel at home, Tuesday um, dress down, all those kind of things. They don't want to be stressed. They want adventure. So balance it when you are managing them. All right, those were the opinions of the youth across Africa about managing Gen Zs and effectively hiring them. And I can't help but wonder, you know, the last person talked about competitive salaries. And I'd like to ask Esther this question. Now, we hear that Gen Zs like to compare themselves with their contemporaries, their colleagues uh, elsewhere, their friends, you know. And then it, 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 it now looks like there's that kind of pressure, especially with social media now. You know, a lot of people want to be on the same level with their friends or even do better, but they're not willing to put in the work. So isn't that a bit, you know, the pressure? Is it not unnecessary? And isn't that a bit too much to ask? Thank you for that. I, I believe that the pressure cuts across all ages, millennials and Gen Zs. Gen Zs are not the only one feeling the pressure. And it is just fair to have everyone get a good salary skill. It's not asking for too much, right? Because the consistent theme is that Gen Zs are innovative. They have so much to give, right? And if a person is giving so much of themselves, being creative, being innovative, it is only fair 
to reward what they're given. It's not really about the, the competition, although I do agree with the person in an aspect, but it's beyond the competition. It's the fact that um, on a global scale, they have so much to offer. Then they want to be rewarded for what they're offering. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Esther. And also, um, okay, there's a thin line, right, between being rude and knowing what you want. And that seems to be the bone of contention, especially with the Gen Zs right now. In the arguments, you see people say, I know what I want, I know what I'm going for, and I won't go for less, you know, things like that. But there's a thin line between being rude and actually knowing what you want. Do you think that the Gen Zs understand this? And, you know, can we talk about that for a second? Yes, I, I do believe there's a, there's a thin line in that. Uh, and that thin line is basically a concept of communication, right? And that is something that I believe, of course, everybody needs to work on. When it comes to Gen Z, yes, just like we believe that there's a room for growth, right? Um, I also think that communication is something, is a skill that needs to be honed in this generation and needs to get better, needs to be improved on, right? And of, of course, as an employer of labor, I see that, I equally work with Gen Zs, right? And I see that communication is something that we are actually good at, but of course, we need to improve on. That one is a fact, right? But like I said, it cuts across all, all ages, and it's something that we still have a lot of room to improve upon. The fundamental thing about knowing what you want is good. But if if you're not able to communicate it rightly in the workplace, then chances are that you'll struggle to get that, right? So, of course, it, um, it's fair to say that communication is still an area that we need to work on as much. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's what I'll say. All right, thank you for that. Okay. Uh, also, Adebanke, so can we say that these people come across as rude to recruiters because for uh, the longest time... Okay, you know what? Unfortunately, I think we lost Adebanke. Hopefully, she joins us back. But let me come back to you, okay? Uh, it's still talking about the thin line between being rude and knowing what you want. Can we say that Gen Zs are seen as rude because for the longest time, companies have had yes men who do exactly what they were told to do and nothing else. But these people, you know, know what they want and they're vocal about it. Can we say that is the case? There's an, there's an atom of truth in that, right? It's a new way of doing something. And as I mentioned previously, right, change is something that people would push back, you know, a bit. Once you see somebody communicating in a different style that you're not used to, you tend to, you know, query that. You tend to want to know why that is. And that could cause a friction in how com communication is received. Because, of course, communication is a two-way street. I can say something, but you can interpret it in a different way entirely. So how we say we want a particular thing at the moment might not sit well with how uh, management, who is not in that generational bracket, would receive that. Um, I, I do believe that there, there are people in the Generation Z that do not communicate uh, what they want properly, yes, but I also believe that the amount of people in, in that same generational bracket that do communicate what they want properly is on a higher scale. The, the, the issue, um, a lot of the times, is in how that feedback is interpreted. It is new, right? And so anything that is, is coming at you and seems like change, initially, the default is pushback try to understand what it actually is. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, we have Adebanke back with us, so I will direct the same question to you from your own perspective. And I was asking, okay, that, um, you know, do you think that Gen Zs are seen as rude? Because for the longest time, these companies have had people who only do what they're told to do without questioning, without, you know, wanting to know uh, the rationale behind it. But these people, the Gen Zs now know what they want and they know what they don't want. So when they question it, a lot of people seem to push back on that and say that, you know, that's that's how Gen Zs behave. So do you think that they, they are seemingly rude because they know what they want and they're vocal about it? Okay, thank you for that blessing. Um, in a way, yes. However, here is the thing for me, um, being vocal or letting go directly to the fact that when you're trying to voice out what you want, there are ways to do it, right? So for me, right, it's no more about um, trying to say what you, it's about to communicate what you are trying to say. So it's even beyond, I want to say this, it's about how you communicate that thing actually. And actually for me right now, based on what Uke said, to be vocal and bold doesn't mean you're a good person. Sometimes also, we also have this notion of, of if you're a vocal person, if you're bold and quite daring in terms of how you also speak, it means you're a good person. No, I like to disagree with that. 
the fact that you're a vocal person and you like to always voice out, you want your opinion aired, doesn't mean you're necessarily a good person. So that's just what I would say to answer that question, bless you. All right, thank you for that, Adebanke. Uh, Esther, I would also like to ask, now, it's been said that Gen Zs do not have patience. And that's why, you know, I, I saw something funny on uh, social media on lighter note, you know, where a guy posted uh, a comic video about hiring a Gen Z a month ago. And then the Gen Z is coming to ask, you know, I, I need room for growth. I need to grow. I feel like I'm not doing anything. So it, it brings the question, do you think that the Gen Zs can be patient enough? You know, some people work at a place for like two, three, four years before you start seeing, you know, progress, improvement. But the Gen Zs don't seem to be having it that way. What do you think? Uh, thank you for that. So um, I always like to see it this way that patience is not about the Gen Z. Patience is a human value, right? And the level of patience should not be measured by a generation, but by humans themselves. But if we're measuring patience by generation now, I believe that Gen Zs have options in a way, or they believe that we believe that we have so much options or so many options and that if we are short change in a place, we can move to another place. It's not that we don't have patience, but the concept of, oh, I know my self-worth, I know what I'm worth, and if a company is not offer, offering me what I'm worth, then I can move to a different place. It's also, it also ties into what we talked about earlier on with the compensation, right? If I'm not well compensated, then let me move on to a, a company that would value me, that would value what I am going to be offering. All right, thank you for that, um, Esther. So before we go ahead, we have some social media reactions, uh, you know, of Gen Zs from their interview. So we want us to take a look at that, and we'll be right back. Person says, uh, Oiga Michael says, the MD introduced himself as Rajesh, and something pushed me, and I said, Kuthrapali, whatever that means, and he said, what? So I spent about six minutes explaining TBBT. And in the end, after explaining, he said, thank you for your time. We'll get back to you. Olusi, I mean, that's an insult in Yoruba. Didn't call me back. Now, another person said, so this is basically tweets from, you know, interviewers and their interviewees, Gen Z interviewees, obviously. Now, Chris says, they asked me where I saw myself in five years. I told them how I'll be married with two kids and how I and my husband will be abroad with our own house and a car. I'm sure they didn't call the person back. <laughs> All right, the next person. Jeff Chang says, Omo, I spy person CV. One of the core competences I wrote was ingenuity, and I spied it too. It was for a teaching job in a nursery school. Though. The man carried my CV and asked me the meaning of ingenuity, and I said, it means fake. Oga starts to laugh. I just told him to give me my CV. All right. Mulbrick says, before I was called in, they shared Fanta and Puff Puff. Omo, when I got there, puff puff is, you know, a, a snack, I would say that, is a finger food native to the Nigerian people. Um, when I got there, interviewer asked, uh, interviewer asked, why do you want to work with us? And I said, ever since I have been going for interviews, I have never been given food. I would really love to work here. Uh, this person says, after the technical interview, they asked me why I think I should be picked. And the person says, I be beans, you know, because they pick beans. I asked under my breath, but one of the four guys heard. I wonder how he did. He kept on laughing, then he muted, and the other guys muted too. Obviously, it was a Zoom call. One of them unmuted and told me that would be all, and I'm sure he didn't get the job. <laughs> Another person says, I was interviewing with a boutique audit firm, and they asked whether I'd, I'd apply to any others. I replied, honestly, one of the big four. And then one of them asked which offer I'll take if I got both. I asked him which offer he would advise his daughter to accept. All right, I mean, these are really hilarious tweets about the Gen Z's and, you know, their recruitment processes. Anyways, so let's let's come back to our conversation now. Okay, let's face it. These Gen Z's are made to believe that they have loads of options, which to a certain degree is true, you know, like I mentioned earlier. And that's why they don't necessarily need a certain job. They just go with what they want. And if that's not working for them or at any slight inconvenience, they bounce. But are there really options like they say? Because if you look at it, not everyone can be an influencer or have a successful podcast or, you know, work with brands. So isn't this giving them false hope in a way? I think that it is actually not false hope. Um, when it comes to understanding options and opportunities, it's, first of all, an inherent understanding. By that, I'm trying to say that we are skilled, all right? 
and we understand fundamentally how to translate that skill into viable opportunities. So sometimes when we're, we're seeking for companies to work with and where we can deploy our skills, we fundamentally understand that this is not the only place and this is not the only opportunity through which we can express our gifts, express our talents, right? So it's, it's more of an inherent belief and not necessarily even um, environmental in nature. We grew up with the understanding that platforms have been built that can enable us to harness opportunity. And so whether or not you are an influencer, and by influencer terms, I'm talking about having a very large following, you actually do not even have to have a large following, more or less even show your face these days to be able to profit off of the opportunities that exist, especially digital opportunities, which we clearly have a very good understanding of. So it's for me, it's an inherent belief. Personally, I like to know and tell myself that I am skilled, well-skilled. I cannot lack because I can always translate my skills in any economy, in any environment. And so that makes me powerful, first mentally, before I even get into um, the marketplace to be able to put, uh, put the skills to practice. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, Adivike, I would also like to ask you, I mean, Uke made something, uh, made a very salient point, you know, about being mentally prepared and mentally confident about yourself. But a lot of people, um, you know, around Africa and even in the, uh, the world do not exactly have the skills that they are so confident about. And by that, I mean, so many people go about saying, which is a good thing, it's a good thing, but, you know, saying things like, you know, I, I can't so far, I can't be stranded, I don't need anybody, I don't do this, I don't do that. But, uh, you know, technically speaking, they don't exactly, they're not exactly equipped for whatever it is that they're yeah. claiming to have. Sure. So. Again, I ask, you know, from your own perspective, do you think that the options that they always talk about is just false hope? I do not agree. The options they claim to have is not false. It's not false, right? The issue here is the fact that they are not able to leverage on the options based on their lack of technical skills. And it's not always all about technical skills most times. Most of them actually do lack a whole lot of personal development. When it comes to soft skills, they are really, really lacking in that area. So all these opportunities, yes, they are available, but can they assess it should be the question we should be addressing. And from what I have seen so far, most of them do not have the um, capability to assess all the options and opportunities because of the lacking technical skills and lacking um, soft skills. You know, soft skills, uh, okay, was, okay mentioned something about communication. Communication for some of us might be like a very, very tiny thing. It's just communication. It's just for me to talk, right? No. Communication is way beyond that. Communication can, you can sell a business. You can, you can have a startup. You can have a successful business based on how you communicate. So because of the fact that they are not able to unless this particular soft skill and various other soft skills that I'm not, I'm not going to be able to mention here. So because of the lack of all these soft skills, they are not, they most likely will not be able to unless all these options and opportunities that we are talking about. But if the opportunities are, 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 are the real thing we have out there, yes, there are opportunities for them. All right, so um, Esther, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question. Now, we were talking about communication earlier, and I still want us to hammer on that for a bit, right? So most Gen Zs believe, which is, like I said, good, that you know they're well-equipped, they have you know the talents, they have the skills, if they really do. But one thing that they're for, they seem to be forgetting is most millennials who make up most of their recruiters are still, you know, I wouldn't say stock up, but they, they're still strong believers of simple things like manners, you know, which some of the Gen Zs lack. So it is, it, it's quite, there's, there's a gap in between where a Gen Z believe that, that, you know, they have the skills required, but they don't have the manners to back it up. And so they don't get a job and they're wondering why, how, you know. But for the recruiters, it's just as simple as you come in, you don't greet anybody, or you come in and you're having an attitude or we're asking you a question and you're referring us to this and that. So I would like for us to talk about that a bit, you know, comparing communications with manners and how important it is for these Gen Zs to remember that they're not dealing with their fellow Gen Zs. They're dealing with people who, you know, are heavy on manners, on greetings, on courtesy. What do you think about that? You're right. Th thank you for that. And this is coming from a Gen Z, so I might be, I might be a Gen Z right now. Oh, please feel free. That's all we want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that the, the gap you mentioned is not, it's culture, right? That is the gap. 
what is the difference between manner and culture? Is it that the employers want culture over manner or manner over culture? No, but you know that culture differs, right? If we're talking about culture, then some people believe that you should, you know, kneel to greet them. You know, some believe the handshakes. But I I mean, I'm talking about manners now, where you just walk in and just a simple hi will suffice. But some people, some Gen Zs can't do that. They just walk in and believe, you know what, I own this place. I just sit down and, you know, do whatever I want to do. So it's not exactly culture, but like the manners itself. Okay, so I work here in the UK and it is weird if I walk into my office and I greet my co-worker. They find that weird. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's not like a regular thing to do that, going about and greeting everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's, just, it's like, to them, it's like, you're at love. So I, I think that, uh, well, it's more of a culture, manner thing than just a manner thing, right? Yes, of course, we need to learn communication. And one thing I have noticed about we Gen Z is, is that we, we, we could be overconfident, which is not a good trait. Maybe we need to learn to tone down our confidence a bit, right, to accommodate our culture. But I would say that it's not mainly about manner. It's more of culture. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, also, at I, I would like to ask, I mean, we have been talking about hiring Gen Zs and how you know challenging it can be. But what do you think the advantages of having these people work with a company is? Okay, can you call me the question again, Blessing? I okay, I, I said we well. have been talking about, you know, the challenges attached to hiring Gen Zs and, you know, their characteristics, the way they behave. But I would like for us to talk about the positive sides now. What the advantages of having these people? Because let's face it, these people are more innovative. They're creative. It's just maybe sometimes the way they communicate differs. But they have that creativity. They're willing to go all out. So what do you think the advantages are of having these people work with a company? Yes. So one major thing I'm going to highlight here is the fact that Gen Zs are risk takers. So when it comes to working in an organization, right, they are quick to take some risk. Of course, risks that will eventually benefit business, right? So one major thing that I've, I've observed so far is the fact that Gen Zs are risk takers and also they are agile. You don't need to motivate them. They are more or less self-motivated as long as your, um, the value they have aligns with the organization. Trust me, every other thing is a smooth sailing. They do not necessarily need um, motivation, motivation, as long as the major thing that brought them into the business is already sorted. So another thing is the fact that they are business-minded. They are entrepreneurial in thinking. And that's one major thing that is actually a good fit for an organization. Of course, they are also digital savvy. And knowing fully well that where we are right now, we, are, um, we have now evolved into a more digital space. So all these things are things that will actually work together. Um, they are the advantages I'm going to highlight when you have changes in, in an organization. The fact that they are agile, the fact that they are highly in, innovative, right? So I know it's a different thing when you're innovative and also when you're willing to try it. That's why I mentioned it about the fact that Gen Z's are risk takers. They're willing to take the risk. They do not shy away. So you see them always ready to solve um, issues, always ready to solve problems in, in the workplace. So Gen Z's are quite, quite, they have a whole lot of advantages as much as we alighted other issues or challenges it might be having them around. So they have quite a whole lot of ad- advantages when you have them in the organization. Okay, well, Adibanke, let's talk about the difference in perspective now, right? I mean, you have mentioned some of the advantages and one of which is risk taking. So imagine you have a Gen Z in a company and their own approach towards things that, you know, things they believe that they can do to make things work is quite different from how the millennials, how the bosses and managers and, you know, superiors will think. How, when, was, isn't that going to clash? I mean, for example, a Gen Z believes that, you know, for uh, effective ma- uh, marketing, you have to go on social media and, you know, do some content with trending sounds that is more of a Gen Z thing. But the managers believe that, no, let's go the old-fashioned way, you know, go out, talk to people, organize seminars and events and all of that. But the Gen Zs know that this is the new way it's done. I mean, that conflicting situation, how, how does that affect the companies and the Gen Zs? Okay, so in a whole lot of ways, it can actually affect. But of course, um, one thing we've, we've learned how to 
one thing we've uh, one way we've learned how to sort that is really highlighting what exactly are the reasons causing these particular issues. You made mention of the fact marketing right now. Gen Z, Gen Z is saying, okay, fine, we should do this via social media. A millennial is thinking, oh no, let's just go go to this go to company A, company B, and everything of sort. So what we've learned to do right now is to identify our target audience. Who exactly are we trying to target? Is it those on social media or is it those um, the traditional means of marketing? So that's what we've tried, we've learned how to do. Now, in terms of policies in the organization right now, now for HR professionals, one thing we've also learned to do is how to manage, leverage. We are not just thinking, we know that right now we have a whole lot of Gen Z's influxing into the work, workplace, right? Now, it would not be wise for us to now say because we have Gen Z coming in, coming in, coming in. Now, let's forget every other generation and focus on these guys because of these um, things that we've identified about them. So what we've learned to do is how we can make them cohabit in terms of our policies right now. We try to make it as um, as accommodating as possible. And to a large extent, personally for me, I've seen where um, Gen Z and millennials are, are really, really accommodating each other to the benefits of the organization. And one thing I've also come to realize is the fact that they can actually do collaborate extreme, extremely well. I don't know where we have this un, um, understanding or idea of the fact that there's always going to be a clash. Yes, there will be a clash sometimes, but once they all, once both generations align together, it's a good thing for the for the goal of the business. All right, thank you so much for that, Adi Banker. Now let me come to you, UK. Um, let, let's talk about the emotional blackmail. You know that we don't always talk about when it comes to Gen Z's and their managers or supervisors, right? So there's a situation and the manager is trying to call a Gen Z to order. You know, he raises his voice a little, the Gen Z sends a mail, a very, you know, gut-wrenching mail. Or they try to correct you a little, or they try to tell you, you know, something isn't working and you feel, oh, that is emotional harassment. Oh my God, I can't deal, you know, I can't stand it, it's toxic. How, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> I, 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 can, I can understand um, the question perfectly. And for, for me, I think that for the, some of them who do that um, still have a lot of work to do to properly understand how to receive the feedback and how to communicate, okay? So if somebody says something or gives you feedback in a manner that is maybe disrespectful or in some way that doesn't sit right with you, there is a manner of approach. There is a way to do things, right? You have to apply tact and wisdom into everything that you do. So I understand that these things cause friction in the workplace and rightly so, we actually do have people who respond in inappropriate manners and this is not to excuse it at all, right? This is me saying that for those people who are Gen Z's that act out in that manner, the truth is you need to understand that you are in the workplace and it is not only you that is in that workplace. You have a mix of generations. Boomers are there, millennials are there, Gen Z's are there, and a whole lot, right? So you have to understand that as much as we, they are trying to work with you, they have a different kind of thinking and manner of approach. They were used to giving feedback a particular way. You can't just expect everybody to get along with your program and do everything in the workplace as you see fit, right? So you need to still have solid principles because there's also, you know, the thing about employability, right? So it's not just employment alone. You need to be employable and be able to manage a career, a career path, right? These things come with skills other than the technical skills you may possess or the digital skills you may possess, you need to learn how to communicate, you need to learn how to receive feedback. So those are the little gray areas that I can certainly say that there is room for growth and we should do better at that because um, we have a few people who, you know, do that. And just like the tweets that we saw, right, it, it was very comical you know, in nature, but that doesn't still represent the vast majority of Gen Z's who seek for work. That is just a subset of it. And for those people in that category, I, I do say that uh, we need to do better in how we receive feedback and how we communicate because it actually can be 
um, a challenge, a challenge in the workplace. All right, thank you for that, uh, Uke. Uh, Esther, the the part of the world where you are, I mean, people are very accustomed to having this amazing set of people, you know, work with them, you know, so they, they don't have any problems hiring them or being colleagues with them. But let's look at this part of the world, Africa, you know, with all of these constraints and challenges that people see with Gen Zs on a daily basis, can you now see how it can be difficult for Gen Zs to get hired? Because nobody wants to walk on eggshells when they get hired. Like, I don't want to hire someone who, when I'll start telling me, oh, I need room for growth after two weeks, you know, and then I'm wondering, does he want my job? Does he want to run the company? Or, you know, someone who cries at every instant where I scold them or, you know, I'm just given instances. So you see how it can now be challenging for organizations. I, I, I was going to ask you why you think that Gen Zs in this part of the world do not easily get jobs, even those who are doing their, uh, you know, yearly service. It, it's always hard for recruiters to consider bringing them on the team because to them it's like a setback. What do you think? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pick back on what uh, Uki said about employability. We have many Gen Zs with the technical skills, but not necessarily the soft skills to work in a company. And this, this is because of many factors, including personal development. I believe that Gen Z should work on how they develop themselves professionally. They need to understand that the social life is different from the professional life, and they need to work actively on developing the right skills for the workplace, including communication. I, I believe that we really need that. We need to work on that aspect of communicating because many Gen Zs lack that. All right, thank you so much for that, Esther. Uh, thank you um, to my guests for you know being wonderful. Right, we'll be back to talk about this more, but right now we have some tweets. We have more tweets uh, that we would like for you to see. So take a look. Paul Confidence says, hiring Gen Z they bring just as much stress as the energy they bring to the team. Okay, so it's a 50-50. Chef Derry says, Gen Z, they bust my head. You come for an interview without a copy of your CV because you already submitted it previously. And this reminds me of a joke where uh, they were asking the interviewee that, you know, tell me a little about you. And the interviewee is like, I submitted my CV, right? And they said, yes, you did. I said, okay, you tell me a lot about me. <laughs> that was really hilarious. Okay, let's go back to the tweets. All right, so another person says, one day this trash Gen Z group is going to normalize wearing sweat sweatpants to job interviews and weddings. I mean, well, this is a jab at how they dress, obviously. But anyways, that's all the tweets that we have right now. But let's talk about long-term goals of companies. And I'll start with you, Adebanke. You are the HR professional. Do you think that these set of people fit into a company's long-term goals? Because when you ask them where they see themselves in five years, what you hear is, you know, like we saw in the tweet, vacation, you know, with their husband, with their best friends, living their lives on a yacht, you know, things like that. So do you think that they fit into a company's long-term goal? Okay, so for me, um, it's a no. They do not fit into a company's most, let me use the word, some do not actually fit into a company's long-term goal. But for, for, for as an HR professional, right, I've come to understand the fact that I am pretty much do not want to see long-term goal. You staying over the course of five years, eight years. I'm pretty much concerned about your quality of work while you are here. So even if you're going to spend a year, um, six months, two years, the quality of work you're going to do, that is really what I'm looking up for right now. So if they are going to fit, so in the long run for me, I still feel like the, the, the aspect of their quality of work, even um, standing the test, test of time, while they are gone, while they've left the organization, is now what I now look at right now. So it is very, very weird. We know Gen Z's when, when it comes to job hopping. Right. It's like they are always together. Gen Z right now, they do not even, they, most times you don't even get the normal notice period. You just see them and... You were saying something earlier about the whole jackpot thing and they are off. And sometimes there is not even communication from them to the HR. They are just off out of the business. And that's just it. So what, what we have come to manage all this is just understanding the facts, understanding how I can manage them while they, while they are here with us, why they are in this organization now. The quality of your work 
you are not going to be spending two years, three years here. While you are here, can we have quality of service from you right. to the organization? All right. Thank you so much for that, Adibanke. Now, UK, I'll ask you the same question. Do you think that Gen Z fits into a company's long-term goal? Okay, so I, I think that's a, a very relative. Um, the truth is, the Gen Z are the people that are going to be working for a longer time now than the millennials and um, other generations above them. And that is simply just uh, a numbers game. You know, they're younger, so they have more working life. So I think that it's savvy for um, companies to understand how to harness their potential and make them uh, have and make a solid plan. Uh, you know, for growth for hiring people that are from Generation Z, right? So I think that they can fit into a company's long-term goal. However, like I said, long-term goals can be relative. But it is also important to understand that times change. You know, now we have Gen Z that are looking for the next opportunity and the next opportunity and the next opportunity. They are not satisfied at a particular level and they don't walk into companies, you know, easily thinking, hey, I think I want to be here for 10 years. I want right. to be amazing here for eight years. If that happens, then that's okay. But they are hunting for opportunities. They put themselves first, right? Mm. Not the company first. And you know, who, who, who's to blame them? At the end of the day, um, the company, you, you are there working for that company, you're giving your time, your resources to ensure that you can you know, have a better life for yourself and your right. family. Right. You can blame them for putting themselves first, right? right. So um, I think that I would agree a lot with what Adebanke said, which is, Understand how to harness their potentials now while you know they are with you, right? right. And don't be overburdened with how can this person be with us for the next ten years. All right, thank you so much. Welcome. All right, thank you for that. You can, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but because of our time, I'd like to ask Esther very shortly, in a few seconds, what do you think about this? Do you think they fit into a company's long-term goal? Yes, I think so because they're literally the future, right? So we need to accommodate them in a way. Thank you. All right, short and witty. Thank you so much. Thanks to my guest, UK, uh, a co-founder, CEO, Go Nomad Africa in Lagos, Nigeria, Adibanke, Adiri Big Bay, rather, human resource professional, Lagos, Nigeria. And of course, Esther, I would not want to call your surname. It's a beautiful name, but I don't want to <laughs> abuse it. Education is Sheffield, United Kingdom. Thank you so much for being lovely guests with me on the show today.